Well, Valentine's Day is something that we are taught to celebrate from little kid days, from the time that we're in elementary school. I easily remember making Valentines for my friends and then taking them to school and putting them in the shoe boxes that were on everybody's desk. Does anybody have that kind of shared memory? Yeah, and now today it's so big that any public building that you go into, there are hearts and there are flowers and there are sales. <laughs> there are sales. The retailers are all over Valentine's Day. Nikki, my partner, has been shopping for office furniture for her new office and there are love specials galore. <laughs> but it's actually documented scientifically that love is very good for us. For one thing, love protects your heart. There was a study at the University of Pittsburgh that, said, that studied women who were in good marriages, and they found that women who were in good marriages, as opposed to women who were in high-stress marriages, they had lower instances of cardiovascular disease. Now, I'm sure that they've studied somewhere men who were in good marriages and found the same thing, it's just that I could not find that study to share with you. <laughs> the second thing is, love leads to a longer life. The, I'm going to say it, the National Longitudinal Mortality Study has been going on since 1979. It has over a million participants, and they have found in this study that people who are in committed relationships have longer lives. They also have few cases of influenza and fewer cases of pneumonia, fewer cases of cancer. They live longer lives. And as I started to take a look at this study, I realized it's not just intimate relationships that people are committed to that promote longevity. It's relationships with our best friends. It's relationships with a beloved family member, and it's relationships with a beloved pet. People who have lifetime companions known with four legs or with feathers also have longer lives, which explains all the jokes about old ladies and their cats, right? <laughs> I mean, it's true. The third thing is it helps beat cancer. University of Iowa did a study where they looked at women who had ovarian cancer and found that the women who had significant relationships in their lives and significant friendships had more of the killer cells, the natural killer cells activity at the site of their tumors. So these uh, desirable white blood cells kill the cancer cells as a part of the body's natural immune system, and they're there naturally because they have these committed relationships. So scientifically, we're now able to label what we've known spiritually for a very long time. We've known spiritually for a very long time the importance and the presence of love in our lives. The Bible, which is the Christian scripture, the New Revised Standard Version, has the word love in it 731 times. And it shows up in scripture like this one from Mark that says, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, which is actually a restatement of this one from Leviticus which says you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then in the New Testament, Jesus said something very radical and at the time quite shocking and still kind of hard for some of us to do, which is love your enemies. Love your enemies, but it's not, love is not just important in the context of the Christian religion. It's important in the context of all the world's religions. This top one is from the Jain scripture, which is called the Adamas, which is the, one of the oldest, long, continuous religions in the world. It's older than Hinduism. It says, love, which is free from birth, old age, disease, death, grief, pain, and fear, is eternal, blissful, and the nature of pure delight. From the Hindu tradition in the Bhagavad Gita, with consciousness unified through love, they see everything with an equal eye. And the last one is from a Sikh scripture, the Adi Granth, that says, those immersed in the love of God feel love for all things. 
Unity is part of a larger philosophy called New Thought, which was started, I think I've told you before, by Plato a very, very long time ago. But as a philosophy, it had a reemergence in the 18th and the 19th centuries because people were looking for mind cures. They were looking for healing, and they were finding that these principles that were in the body of philosophy called New Thought actually worked, and healing miracles were occurring. One of the women who in the U.S. who is a guru of new thought is this one here. Her name is Emma Curtis Hopkins. She's called the teacher of teachers. And the reason she's called the teacher of teachers is because she was Myrtle and Charles Fillmore's teacher. And Myrtle and Charles started our unity movement. But she was also the teacher of Nona Brooks and Melinda Kramer, who started Divine Science. She was also the teacher of Ernest Holmes, who started what was called originally Religious Science and now is called Center for Spiritual Living. And that's the movement that gave birth to Michael Beckwith and where the Agape International comes out of. So she is part of our lineage. She's part of our heritage. And this is what she says about love. All people will change when you know, when you know that they are loved. We shall change when we know that we ourselves are formed out of love. All is love. There is nothing in the universe but love. Love, love, love. I don't really think she was the Beatles teachers. <laughs> but if all there is is love, all there is is love. She taught Myrtle and Charles, and one of the articulations that Myrtle and Charles have about love is that it's an energy that emanates from our hearts and desires nothing but the best for the object of its affection. So what if the object of our affection was us? Love is the harmonizing and healing principle. What if it was us? individually, ourselves, who was in need of healing and harmonizing. We're taught as Americans in, in any, many other cultures in the world, we're taught that love goes out. We're taught love your neighbor. We're taught love your brother. Love your sister. Love the Lord God with all your heart, that outward flow of love. But the inward flow of love is equally important. The inward flow of love is what actually rejuvenates us. The inward flow of love is what allows us to be able to source that outward flow. We can think of the analogy of a river, and we're in the river the river of love, and we're floating along the river of love, when we're floating along the river of love, we can actually experience love. We can have a real, solid experience of love. And when we get up in our head and we start thinking, we start swirling around and we get spun up and we begin to eddy, and then we're on the side of the river and we're no longer in the flow. We are having a non-experience of love. There's a dictionary definition of love that I want to share with you. It says, experience is the act of living through an event or events, personal involvement in or observation of events as they occur. So thinking is passive and experiencing is active. Thinking is what we do on the sidelines Experiencing is how we truly begin to open up our understanding of love. Experiencing is actually the way we begin to amplify that love. Think about Emma Curtis Hopkins. If we are born from love, if we are created from love, then love is all we are. In Gay Hendricks' book, Learning to Love Yourself, Gay has this wonderful diagram and it looks like this, because he delineates the thinking part from the experience part. So starting at the bottom, hoping you can love yourself, 
is really outside. Because you're saying, well, I feel this way, and I hope someday I can have the experience, but I'm not having it now. So hoping puts it outside, and, and we think love is separate from us. Wishing is one step up. Wishing is just the more romanticized version of hoping. I wish my Prince Charming would come into my life. I wish putting Prince Charming out here and not here. So it's that activity or that strategy that separates us. So that's what hoping and wishing do. Deciding to love yourself doesn't work at all. Because deciding is for when you have choices. Choices like, should I have crunchy or should I have creamy peanut butter? <laughs> choices like, should I go right at the le light or left at the light? Choices like, should I listen to Bach or should I listen to the Beatles? Those are either or. Des there's no deciding about love because love is what we are. I come back to Emma Curtis Hopkins. We are born from love. All we are is love. All there is is love. So it's not like we can decide one day I'm not love because it's what we are. It's like for me waking up one day and saying, I just wish my skin wasn't white. It's not going to happen. It's what I am. Just like I am love. Number four is believing. And in this context, it's the beliefs that are surrounding the experience. In this context, it's the beliefs we hold that we think are true about the experience. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you go under the apple tree one day and you experience enlightenment. It was a flash and it was fun and it was amazing. Believing that the apple tree had something to do with the flash of enlightenment is what's keeping us thinking and in non-experience because we keep going back to the apple tree thinking it's the apple tree. Or it's like when we go, oh, if I just listen to this song, I can go deep into meditation because I did that once. We think it's the song. The belief is that it's the song and not the experience. So you see how belief can be this insidious trap that keeps us in the non-experience zone. So it is with beliefs about self-love. I could love myself if I could just lose weight. That's a popular one. I could love myself if I just had a cute, perky little nose. I could love myself, you know him, Sam. If I were smarter, or I could love myself if I wasn't so smart. <laughs> Say another one. I mean, you know, I mean, it works both ways. This is how insidious beliefs are. So I could love myself if I wasn't so conceited. I could love myself if I wasn't so selfish. I could love myself. It's like all these beliefs we have about ourselves are not the truth of us. The truth of us is that we are loved. The next one is reasoning that you are lovable. And I can say, at this stage of my life, I have mastered reasoning. Because at this stage of my life, I should be lovable. I've worked hard enough. <laughs> right? At this stage of my life, I should be lovable. Uh, it, I, because I'm a minister, I should be lovable. Because then that sets a good example for everybody else to become lovable. See, reasoning is just getting stuck in those mind eddies. It's getting spun up that'll swing us to the side of the river instead of having us continuing to float, to swim, and to really enjoy the journey of the experience of love. Now, once we go above the line, accepting is not a passive activity. Accepting is probably one of the most powerful choices that we can make for ourselves because accepting opens us up. It takes our mind from all that stuff we got spun up, and it's free. It's free to be and have the experience of being loved from the inside, from the outside, from the inside, from the outside. It, accepting opens that up. And then I think the gateway is being willing. That word willing is the gateway to a higher experience. And sometimes we have to be willing to be willing but to be willing to open us up. So are you willing to experience self-love? Yes. Okay, we got one. 
We have maybe two, or maybe 187 today, who might be willing for just a moment to experience self-love. The Prophet Muhammad says that when we are kind, we turn whatever we're kind to into a thing of beauty. So my invitation is to be kind to ourselves, just like we're kind to another. You are kind. You are beautiful. I invite you to turn and find eye contact with someone in the room and say, you are kind. You are beautiful. You are kind. And you are. Kind. You are beautiful. You are kind. You are beautiful. See how easy that was? See how easy it is to be kind to someone else? Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and put your hands over your heart. Close your eyes and put your hands over your heart and say, I am kind. I am kind. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. And breathe. And then silently to yourself one more time say, I am kind. I am beautiful. And it's a good start. It's a good start. The last one, number eight, be willing to be the source of love. For when we discover that we are the source of love, then we're no longer seeking love. We realize that love lives here. Love lives in me. Love lives in you. Love lives in each and every one of us, wanting nothing but the best for the object of its affection, wanting that healing and harmonizing vibration to be moving in and through each and every one of us. As a Valentine present to you today, I've given you a Valentine. It's in your bulletin. And it's an affirmation that Louise Hay gives to people who are committed to loving themselves, who are willing to love themselves. And my challenge to you is this. There are seven sleeps until next Sunday. There are seven days until next Sunday. So in the morning, after you wake up, read it aloud. At night, before you go to bed, unless you're on ship work and then you figure it out for yourself, at night, when you go to bed, read it aloud. And if you are embarrassed because you don't want your spouse or your roommate or the cat or the dog to hear you say this, go in the bathroom, turn the shower on, and read it aloud in there. But I invite you to add the power of your voice to this affirmation. We're going to read it together. Are you ready? Are you ready, ready, ready? To be willing. In the infinity of life where I am, all is perfect, whole, and complete. I'm always divinely protected and guided. It is safe for me to look within myself. It is safe for me to look into the past. It is safe for me to enlarge my viewpoint of life. I am far more than my personality, past, present, or future. I now choose to rise above my personality, to recognize the magnificence of my being. I am totally willing to learn to love myself. All is well in my world. And so it is. Thank you, God, and thank you, Louise Hay. <coughs> Let's take this into meditation. Let's breathe and come into a time of wonder by saying, I send my love. I send my love over the
see